All right, we're going to read from 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. So this is uh, one of the well-known passages looking at the qualifications of a bishop, but I want to make a different application this morning <coughs> to all of us. All right, 1 Timothy 3. <coughs> this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be great, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. First Timothy 3. All right, so the title of my sermon is taken from verse 15 of First Timothy 3, How to Behave Thyself. So I, I hope you didn't shut off when I mentioned that First Timothy 3 is the qualifications of a bishop, because just because it's listed as the qualifications of a bishop in First Timothy 3, that doesn't mean the standard by which we should try and live as men right? Shouldn't, we should be striving to live as those qualifications. So this is not just what God wants of elders and bishops and people in church leadership. He wants every man to strive for that standard. Yeah, but not, can everyone meet that standard? Not everyone meets that standard. Not everyone is even striving for that standard. That's why not everyone is qualified to be a bishop. But we don't look at the qualifications listed and just think, well, I'm, I'm never going to be a bishop, so that they don't apply to me. Or even as a lady, when you learn about the qualifications of a bishop, how to be a godly man, you need to learn these things as well and internalize them because one day you're going to want to teach your son to strive for these qualifications. So these are profitable for all people to understand, hey, what does it mean to be a godly man? See, it's not just how to be a bishop. This is how to be a godly Christian man, what God expects us to strive for. Not, hey, that doesn't apply to me just because one day I don't think I'm going to be a bishop. And maybe you don't see yourself as ever being a bishop. That doesn't mean you shouldn't strive for these. But really, all men should be striving for this office. You know, because if one day, you know, you live your life as a godly Christian man, you can be used one day to lead a church, to pastor a church, because it's not like they're all in abundance. You know, it's not like you can just go anywhere. There's just godly men, qualified men everywhere. The Bible says a faithful man, who can find? And you know, they don't come out of this church. I don't know where they're going to come from. So don't rule it out. Maybe you don't see yourself right now as being a bishop, but just strive for those qualifications. You ought to be striving to be a godly man and a godly example to the church of God. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be in that position. You know, you think when I got saved, when I was a young Christian, you think one day I could see myself pastoring a church, doing all these things, leading a congregation. No way. 
Man, even when like the time was coming, I was still thinking like I couldn't couldn't imagine where are the people going to come from? Who's going to want to learn from me, follow me? But you know, one thing I knew was I said I remember saying to God, you know what? I don't know if ever one day I'm going to pastor a church or be a bishop, but you know I'm going to just strive to be the best Christian I can be, and maybe one day God will use me. God will use me to fill that gap, and here we are today. So don't ever write yourself off as just thinking. Ah, you know, I never see myself as that. Because we ought to be just striving anyway to live up to this standard. And hopefully one day, you know, if you meet those qualifications and you are living the way you should, you can be used by God to fill that office. Because I tell you what, it's a work that is lacking faithful men. You know, this work of God, because, you know, oftentimes people don't even strive for it. They're not having God at the forefront of their mind but as men of god men trying to live for god we ought to think hey maybe one day god can use me but maybe right now is just not the right time so what i want to do is i want to go through these qualifications but rather than preaching at it from a point of hey this is what men who want to go into the ministry or men who want to lead a church should be striving for i want you to look through these qualifications and just apply it to yourself even as a lady because some of these qualifications can apply to women as well and there are some qualifications in there for women so it's not just like when we look at the wives of the deacons and the bishops it's just oh yeah no, that's just for elizabeth that only applies to elizabeth no this applies to all women so we want to look through these qualifications that's what i want to do this morning and just be reminded about the standard that god not only wants those in leadership to have but everybody to strive for so where do i get the title of my sermon from we'll just start here at verse 15 and then we'll go back to verse 1. first timothy 3 but if i tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of god Right, so so much more so important as well as our example to the church right this is it's very important that we re realize that the way we live the things we say the way we present ourselves the way we behave it has an impact on the church so that's why i want you guys to keep this in mind and that's why you know some i've had to tell some people who've been putting in the whatsapp group hey i'm not coming to church i say hey it's best not to do that right because we don't want on saturday night just a bunch of messages of people not going to church right we'd rather on saturday night people saying hey i'm looking forward to going to church tomorrow i'm going to try my best to be there rather than saying i'm not going to be there because if you're on the fence think about it if you're if you're not a very mature christian and you're kind of on the fence you're a bit backsliding you're thinking of skipping church tomorrow and you see a bunch of people skipping church you're probably not going to go either right you're probably thinking oh you know i'm not the only one but sometimes you'll be encouraged when you hear a lot of people going right because it, so we want to make sure when we think about how we live our lives what we say what we do we want to be an encouragement to the people in church because we have to be that example we want to set the example not only for other adults but guys we've got to start thinking about the example we set to the children right we don't want just oh you know we've got our spiritual life in order and then our kids you know what are they going to do right or we don't want to think like you know oh you know my, my kids i want my you know sometimes it's like that with sport you know i'm like that with sport you know i want my kids to play soccer and i don't want to do the training that way i'm thinking like jujitsu i'm putting i want to keep, put my kids into jujitsu and i'm thinking like oh, i don't know whether i want to do it but i'm fine with my kids doing it. people are like that with christianity you can't be like that with christianity yeah you can get away with it with sport and other activities you might put your kids into but with christianity you can't just be a spectator you can't just oh, i want to put my kids in it but i'm not in it you have to be in it too because that's the most important thing in life i don't care if my kids grow up and they don't play soccer i don't care if my kids grow up and they don't become some champion jiu-jitsu player but you know what i do care about i care about if they grow up and they're not a believer they're not somebody living for god that matters to me and if it matters to you too man think about what sort of example you're setting not only for the church but for the next generation man that all you know that's one thing i fear the most is that my kids will grow up and they're not living for god man that ought to drive you to think man i gotta prioritize the things of god i gotta prioritize church i gotta think about how i behave myself in the house of god now obviously this is specifically to timothy that's why i do believe timothy is a bishop right because he's giving the qualifications of a bishop and he's telling timothy hey this is how you ought to behave yourself but remember these standards these qualifications are things we all should be striving for so that's i'll give you a couple of thoughts as i go through this right first timothy this is a true saying 
If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So the first point I want to make here is, you know, a, a godly person ought to have some aspirations. Right? You want to want to improve yourself and get better at things. You don't want to just coast through life and just think, yeah, good enough is good enough. Right? So it's like here. I mean, the godly man desires something more for his life. Right? Maybe he's already working, he's running a business, but he desires the office of a bishop. He desires something greater in his life. So you don't want to just be content with where you are in life. And sometimes people misunderstand verses like this, which talk about contentment. Yeah, but that's talking about contentment in regards to material possessions. Right? Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So we can be happy with the things that we have. But should we, be, should we just be happy with where we are in life? No, we should be striving to do better in all areas of life, right? We want to do all things to the glory of God. So this contentment here that the Bible is talking about is just in regards to how the material possessions that we have. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But see, when it comes to our spiritual life, where we are in our spiritual growth and how we are learning and getting more zealous or getting more knowledge, even in your personal life, at work, don't just coast at work. Then whatever you're doing at work, do to the best of your ability. Try and look for things at work where you can learn more. Don't just go, oh, I'm not getting paid to do this, so I'm not going to do this. That's not the attitude of a godly person. The attitude of a godly person does what's required of them, but also thinks, man, what can I do better? You know, how can I bring more value to my boss? How can I bring more value? How can I increase my skills? Because who knows? You may learn a skill at work that one day God can use. I find that in my own life. I do things at work and I realize, hey, you know what? I can, I can use this to better the church. You know, things I learn about technology and, and I've been able to use that at church. And, and sometimes it's vice versa as well. Something I do for church, it's helped me at work. You know what I mean? Like at work now, I'm like doing video editing and making tutorials and things like that. I learned a lot of this stuff from editing videos for church and things like that. So, you know, you never want to be at a place where you're just content where you are in your life. Materially, yeah. You know, like I mean, you could be just happy with the things that you have. You can be content with such things as you have. But see, when it comes to your spiritual life, look at what Paul says about his spiritual life. He says, but what things were gained to me, so the things of the world, right? Those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He's saying, hey, I'm willing to give these things up to learn more about Jesus. Of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. So not only did, did Paul lose many of the things in his life, the, the honor and the, 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 the things that he did, and he talks about that in, first, in Philippians 3. He says, I suffered the loss of all things. Look at this and do count them but dung. So not only did he lose them, he doesn't care about losing them because he counts them as dung. That I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Beautiful verse referring to salvation by grace through faith, not the works of the law. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. What is he talking about? By any means, if there's a way that he can be perfect in this life. Obviously, it's not possible. But he's saying that's what he's striving for. Not as though I had already attained. So he's not there. Either were already perfect, but I'm happy with where I am. No. He says, but I follow after. If that, that I may apprehend that for which also I apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see how Paul wasn't content with where he was spiritually. He was constantly striving to be better. So it's not just... Yeah, I go to church once a month, that's good enough. Yeah, I go to church once a week, that's good enough. Yeah, I've read the Bible enough, that's good enough. No, the attitude we ought to have is, man, how can I get, how can I do more for God? 
How can I be more involved in church? How can I be more blessing, more blessing to the people at church? How can I learn more? You know, where can, I, where can I squeeze things into my life so I'm getting more knowledge because I'm constantly moving forward rather than just coasting? So there's the desire of a man, of a Christian, right? Godly person to want to be ambitious, right? Aspire to greater things. So if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So you see, he desires to do work. You're a hard worker as well. You're diligent. You're not lazy. That's part of being a godly Christian. So even in your work, in your personal life, don't be a lazy person. We need to be hard working and diligent. What does that mean? You're not just working hard, but you're also doing things of a high standard as well. Sometimes people are really quick, doing a lot of quick, but then they, they make a lot of mess. And then what happens? The boss has to come and fix everything up, right? I'm sure Ozzy, Ozzy knows that. You know, maybe people work really hard to do everything, but then they don't do it to the standard that is expected of them, right? And then they, the boss has to come and redo everything. So as a godly Christian person, hey, work hard, be diligent. Let's go on. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, <coughs> given to hospitality, apt, to teach now blameless obviously doesn't mean sinless because then otherwise nobody would would qualify as a bishop but blameless means that nobody can accuse you of doing wrong because there are some things that are gray areas right like some people might say oh you know well, i don't think you're vigilant enough or sober enough or things like that and there's some gray areas but there are some things where people can be accused of doing wrong like maybe adultery or they've done you know they've theft or they've not, not or being honest in their business practice or something like that where people know that they are doing something wrong and they need to be blameless because when you go into public ministry, all that stuff's going to come out. So that's why you need to be blameless. It's not <coughs> sinless. The husband of one wife. Now, I know people have different views on here on you know, whether that means can a, can a bishop be divorced and whatnot. I'm not really talking about that today, but the one thing I want to remind us of is, man, we've got to have our marriages in order. We gotta have strong marriages. What's the divorce rate these days? People say like three out of four marriages, people divorce. I mean, I'm, I'm sure like, I, I don't know how many people in this room come from a broken family. I mean, I come from a broken family as well. And you know the, the headaches that it causes, the strife that it causes. You know, even when you know, every family event now is an issue because now you gotta deal with mom, you gotta deal with dad, mom's remarried or dad's remarried. Now you got the two different families that you gotta juggle. And, you know, it's, it's probably a, a minority of cases where there's extended family and things are all fine and dandy. Generally, you know, you can see the problems that it causes. You can see the problems that it causes for children. You can see, you know, children, you know, families breaking up and the issues that it causes. We don't want that to happen to us. So that's why we need to have our marriages and our families in order. Make sure, guys, ladies as well, that you are working on your marriage. You know, it's so easy in life to just coast, like we talked about, right? It's no different with your wife and with your children. And you, know, you think, you know, when you first get married, you're just like, no, nah, it's not going to happen to me because my wife's just the world to me and everything like that. All of us have a tendency to take things for granted. And just like, you know, things you take for granted, one day you start taking your wife for granted. You start taking your children for granted. You know, where when you first got married, man, you really appreciated the things that you did for each other. Now you just expect it. So you've got to remember to maintain that relationship. Remember to be appreciative. Remember to spend time with one another. Remember to talk with one another. Remember to be intimate with one another. You need to rekindle, make sure you rekindle that flame. It's like when you have a campfire, right? And that flame eventually dies if you don't maintain it. You've got to blow some air on it. Add some more fuel to the fire. It requires maintenance to keep that passion alive. So make sure you don't get to a point where you, you look back and you don't even think, man, my wife and I don't even really get along anymore. I don't even know. Because it's so easy for that to happen unless you are proactive about it. So make sure you're taking care of your marriage and you're not just coasting and getting too busy. Because it's easy to get busy, right? Because at the beginning, when everything's exciting, that's exciting because you, you, you tend to work on things that you're passionate about and that you're excited about. 
And when you first get married, that's what you're excited about. When you start taking it for granted, now work's more exciting. Your hobby's more exciting. Hanging out with friends is more exciting. But you've got to make sure you, you do the things you need to do, not just things that are fun to do and exciting so you don't take your wife or your husband for granted. <coughs> husband of one wife, vigilant. What does it mean to be vigilant? It means you're on guard. You think of a vigil, right? Sometimes I think security guards are called vigils. Vigilant. So even more so for the leader of the home, but that's what I'm saying. Even though these qualifications are for bishops, hey, moms, got to be vigilant too. Right? You don't just let your kids watch whatever they want. You don't just let your kids do whatever they want. Man, it's crazy today. Like, it, it's funny because um, sometimes I talk, I'm talking to the parents at soccer and, you know, some of the kids are not as well behaved as other kids, right? And we talk about them. Um, and I, I always, every chance I get, if somebody compliments my children, I always tell them it's because they're spanked because they're disciplined. <laughs> I, always, I always give that opportunity to say, hey, it's not an accident, buddy. Like, I don't say it in that tone, but I say like, hey, you know, it's because, hey, I discipline them and make sure I spank them. It's not an accident. Um, and, you know, that's, that's one way you've got to think about in your, in your life. You know, sometimes you don't always get the opportunity to go in deep with the gospel and things like that, but when you get the opportunity, just mention things like that. You know, mention that you go to church, mention things that are happening in the media. You know, this is how you're a light in the world. Because if you think about it, you, you, when you think about, oh, what this world is like, you're really just judging the experiences that you have with people day to day, right? The, the, somebody you know at work, somebody you met at soccer practice, somebody you met at this, and the things, that, the people that you know and the things that they say, that tends to change your perspective on the world. Well, that's one way you are light in the world. So if the world is going towards, oh, you know, don't tell children no, you know, let them be children, let them do what they want, and then they meet somebody and with, with well-behaved children. You know, you know what? I don't let my kids do that. I don't let my kids just watch whatever on the phone. They don't have phones <laughs> right now. You know, like, I don't let them watch whatever they want. And you know, like some kids, they're, they're, they're bad-mouthing the coach at training. And, and sometimes you talk to the parents and you might get onto that topic and you're like, man, my kids will never speak to me like that. And it's just that conversation sometimes will just put in their mind like, oh man, like, hey, I'm not the only one that spanks my kid. I'm not the only one that's hard on my kids. So you see how that's way you can be light in the world. It's like, it's kind of like with uh, like homeschooling and home birth as well. Sometimes I just mention those things to them or the fact that I don't vaccinate my kids. You know, some people believe in vaccinations. I personally don't. But sometimes I, I'll just mention those things in passing or talk about those things because now in that person's life, they now know somebody that home births. So whereas before they're just thinking, oh man, there's just these crazy people at home birth. Now they think, oh, wait, well, I actually know somebody and he's normal, you know, his kids are normal, you know, and he home births and he has good reasons for doing it. So just think about that as well, guys, in your life when, you know, when you deal with people, you know, don't be shy to sometimes mention some of these things because that is one way we are influencing society, right? And you're changing people's perspective and just, you know, because obviously your perspective is going to be a conglomeration of your experiences with different people. Uh, I don't know how I got on that. Um, vigilant. So, oh, that's why. Because vigilant about what your children are watching. So don't just let your children watch whatever. You know, I'm not particularly against having a TV in the home. I, I, I have a TV in the home, but I don't plug it up to the TV, right? We control what our children watch. We don't just let them watch whatever, right? So that's why, you know, we need to be careful what they watch because and you realize, when you realize when your kids grow older, you realize how much they soak in. See, when your kids are young, it doesn't really hit home with you to be a good example and to think about how you speak and to think about the influences in their life and the things that, are, that they're watching. But when they start getting around Sarah's age, Timothy's age, Simon's age, that's when you realize, oh man, now I've got to undo like, a lot of things that they've watched. I've got to, because I, I realize now, man, they've soaked in all this stuff that I wasn't vigilant about. So just be aware of that, guys, in your families. Be vigilant. You know, that's why I would, I mean, I don't see any reason why a kid Simon's age would need a smartphone and a connection to the internet. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, they, they, may, they may have a phone to call them on, but you can take off the internet access. Right? Lock those restrictions out. You know, use the tools that are on those devices so that it's only a phone. 
and make sure they're not just chit-chatting to whoever they want. They can call whoever they want um, and things like that, especially if they're going to a public school and you don't know who their friends are. You don't know who the, the parents are of these friends. You don't know what sort of influences they're getting if you don't know who they are talking to, especially at a young age. At a young age, you need to guard it, right? Once you've trained them and gotten them to a point where they understand right and wrong, there's a bit of resilience there, that's when you can start giving them some freedom. Right? So don't buy into the world philosophy that children just you know, need to be free and just be whoever they are. Because you know what? If you let that philosophy creep into your own life, you're setting your children up for spiritual failure. Yeah, they may be successful in the world. You know, this is what people, you know, sometimes people, they, 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 they miss the standard. You know, when I think about success for my children, I'm not just thinking, yeah, they, they got their finances in order, they own a house, and they're comfortable. That's not what I'm after for my children. I want my children, number one, to be saved, and I want them living for God. You know, that's what I want to, them to be the most important in their life. I don't care what they do for a career. You know, as long as it makes money, it doesn't matter. But you know what I really want? I want them to be a faithful church member. I want them to be soul winning. I want them to be somebody that has taken up personally themselves to think, you know, I am going to lead my family to also be a godly family. Man, that's what's going to make me please. If I see my kids like that, I'm going to be like, I don't care if they're whatever job they do, right? As long as they're a godly leader in their home and setting the example, not only for their kids, but for the next generation. That's what we want. Vigilant, sober, so obviously drunkenness, right? So we have to be careful. I'm not particularly against drinking any alcohol, but be careful how you look. You know what I mean? I think there is a, there's, a, there's a right place and a time and there's a wrong place and a time, but we need to be sober. See, there's a sense of seriousness as well, right, about a Christian. <coughs> so we shouldn't just be joking all the time. Am I against jokes? No, but should, should that characterize our life? Should I be known as just a clown, as a jester, as everything that comes out of my mouth is never serious? No. What should characterize me as a godly Christian is that I'm mainly serious, right? I'm sober about things. Of good behavior. So this is our example to the outside world, right? How do we actually behave ourselves? How do we dress? How do we talk? Given to hospitality. Now, hospitality here is... I think as well, having people over, you know. But what I take from this for you guys, given to hospitality, is it's somebody that has a mind to serve. It's not somebody that comes and it's, what do I get out of this? Hey, what are these guys doing for me? These guys haven't done anything for me lately. What has Victor done for me lately? Or nobody invites me over. That's the attitude of somebody that doesn't have a mind of service. But a mind of service is somebody that comes thinking, hey, who can I pray for? Who can I help? Hey, who can I be a blessing to? You see, it's just a shift in attitude. So when you're given to hospitality, you have a mind of a servant rather than a mind of somebody that wants to be served. The last one here is apt to teach. Now, obviously, in the context of being a bishop, it's being able to preach, being able to articulate things, being able to explain things. But for you guys, for people that may not be a bishop, when you're apt to teach, that means you've got to know some stuff. You've got to know what you're talking about. So when you're apt to teach, in order to teach something, you need to understand something. My dad would always tell me, I try, sometimes when I was younger, I'd try to explain things to him, and I'd be like, ah, I know, I said, I know, I just can't explain it to you. My dad would always say, if you can't explain it to me, you don't, want, you don't know it well enough, yeah. right? So, you know, when you say like, oh, you know, I can't explain these things to my kids, I can't explain spiritual concepts to my kids, or I can't explain this thing, oh, you know, but you come, come to church and somebody can explain it to you, you don't want to be in that situation, right? Because you might not be able to get that person to church to explain it. You need to understand it well enough so that you can explain it. So reflect on that. When you're like, oh, I know this, but I can't really explain it, that means you don't know, know it well enough. Because you know what? If it was a topic you knew well, maybe like sport or, some, or cars or electronics, something like that, man, you could talk, 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 explain every little aspect, right? Because you know it well. That's what you've got to be like with the Bible. That's what you've got to be like with spiritual things because then you're ready to explain things succinctly, precisely, apt to teach, even in your own life, even if you're not going to be teaching publicly. Not given to wine. So that's a no-brainer, right? That we're not drunkards. 
No striker. So this means you're not a violent person. Some people, I'm not a violent person by nature. I guess God made me that way, right? Because if I did, I'd, I'd probably lose the fight. I've always been a lover, not a fighter. But for other people, that's a struggle, right? Some people grow up in rougher homes and rather than talking things out, they just let their fists do the talking. That's not a godly attribute. You know, to be like, oh, you know, this tough person, nobody's going to tell me what to do, I'll, I'll sock them in the face. That's, that's sort of talking. Because you, sometimes you even hear that sort of speech from bishops, trying to be all tough, saying, oh, you know, oh, you know lucky somebody was holding me back, I was going to suck them in the face. But that just shows, like, what sort of godly attitude is that, that you even have that desire? I mean, you've got to be working on removing that desire to want to hurt people violently. Right? So no striker. Not greedy or filthy lucre. So that, I think that one's an obvious one. You know, that you're not covetous. You're not living for the things of this world. That everything you talk about is like the latest this, the latest this, making money, doing this. If that's all you talk about, that's all you care about, you're a covetous person. Right? And covetousness is idolatry because you're putting things before God. Patient. Right? You're willing to wait, but also willing to endure, willing to go through hard times. is a godly attribute. I wonder what about not a brawler? Just, sometimes I just think, why would that need to be there? But, you know, because I mean, everyone's different, right? It's like when I see no striker, I'm just think, easy. I got that one down back. I've never hit, I've never punched somebody in my life. So, like, no striker. I think, like, not a brawler? It's like, because if you think about a brawl, it's like, it's like getting all your mates together, right? And like having a huge punch up. But, you know what I think it's referring to? is I think it's like taking matters into your own hands. Because that's what I think of when a brawl. It's like somebody's done you wrong and you're going to get your mates, you're going to call your cousins, or your cousins come. Do That's what I think of the brawler. It's like, it's like somebody who's got revenge on their mind and wants to take... Because as a godly person, you know what? You've got to give place unto wrath. You don't take the law into your own hands. Sometimes you need to trust God that God's going to work things out. But somebody who's a brawler... You know, he's probably going to go take matters into his own hand, egg the house or something, or slash the tires. I don't know. First Timothy 3. One that ruleth well his own house, <coughs> having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? The one thing I want to mention here is, now obviously for a bishop, you know, that's the testing ground for if you're going to rule the church. Is if you, are you managing your house well? Well, what I want to mention here, just for us, all of us, is sometimes, we, sometimes men see ruling their house and they just think all it is is an iron fist. You know, it's like with spanking. We don't want to be imbalanced. That spanking is not just about discipline, right? There's the nurture and admonition of the law. And ruling your house well is not just... Oh, I said it, that's how it's going to be. And just coming down with an iron fist. Because, I mean, you can try that if you like, you know, and learn it from experience. Or you can learn from wisdom and the Bible, you know, and being gentle, you know, and leading not just with an iron fist, but you need to balance that with gentleness. Because some guys, when they grow up and they're a bit new in life, right, a bit inexperienced, they just think, oh, I'm just going to tell my wife what to do and she's just going to do it. And I, is, that, is that how it works, guys? I don't know. Is that, hey, some, sometimes that works. But you know what? It, it, it only works when you have a relationship there. Because if there's no relationship, you know what? And your wife is not even trying to live godly. You're not trying to encourage your wife to, to do the right thing. You know, she's just going to rebel. She's going to get bitter. She's not going to be obeying you for the right reasons, right? She's not going to be following you for the right reasons. So it's ruling your house. It's not just ruling your house, because you can walk around as a lord as a ruler, and be a ruler in your house, but are you ruling it well? So ruling it well means as a, as a good leader, you're considering emotions, you're considering your relationship, you're considering hey, building that relationship before you bark out orders, right? Getting people, to, to, to me, one important thing before people get married is that you understand what's the authority in the relationship. That it's not just telling the woman, hey, I, I'm in charge in the relationship. The way I think you should go about it is you need to get the, the faith in, in both of you that it's not I'm in charge, it's, how you, it's the Bible's in charge. 
God's in charge of this relationship and God has said it this way. So it's not that I'm just usurping authority because I want to be in charge. It's, hey, I'm usurping authority because God has put me in that position. And if a godly woman wants to follow God, she's going to submit to that role in the family. So we want to rule our children well, not just with an iron fist. You need to balance the nurture with the admonition, just like with the children. <clears throat> Let's go on. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, why is it important that you're not a novice? Sometimes we think being not a novice is just your biblical knowledge. And I think it's interesting, if this is not referring to your biblical knowledge, really there's not much said about biblical knowledge in 1 Timothy 3. I know in Titus 1 it talks about holding fast the faithful word. But I want you to see here as well, as we go through these qualifications, notice how important your character is above your biblical knowledge. So I'm not saying biblical knowledge is not important. And it's something we have to learn because obviously character builds off biblical knowledge. You need to know what the Bible teaches about character in order to do it. But notice that the emphasis when it's saying, hey, this is what you're looking for in a leader. This is what you're looking for in a godly person. It's the character, isn't it? That's what is emphasized. Because honestly, guys, that's what's harder. You know, people get passionate about false doctrine and things like that, and that's good. And generally, you get passionate about those things when you're in a position where there's false doctrine being preached. You know, maybe you're in a church that's not ideal, maybe you're in a false church, maybe you're spending a lot of time online, you're seeing all the false stuff. You get passionate about that stuff. But you know when you start getting more involved at church and everyone here somewhat agrees 99% with right doctrine, that fight's not there anymore. And you know what ends up being important? The relationships, the example, as you said, for the next generation, for the other people. And you know what's harder? Is it harder to just learn some facts about the Bible? Or is it harder to actually change yourself to actually be more loving, more service orientated? to think about how your example affects other people. Man, that's difficult. That takes a lifetime to even get anywhere near, you know, where we, we could possibly be. So not a novice. So why don't you want to be a novice in life? You don't want somebody to be a leader as a novice because they don't have any experience in being wrong. Sometimes when you have more experience, you see failure. You fail yourself. You grow from that. And you know what failure and being wrong does to you, it humbles you, doesn't it? Because then when you realize, man, I don't know everything. Man, I've been wrong before. Maybe I'm not going to go in so brazen this time. You, you, you learn a bit of gentleness when you've been wrong before. You know, you have that experience, whereas novices don't. That's why you see the, the young Christian is just, man, this is how it is. Right? You know the young Christian, this is how it is. I know I'm right. I can't believe you can't see this. That's how they deal with people because they don't have the experience to know, wait, maybe this issue is a little bit more complex than I've realized. And as you have experience in life, you realize things like that. that hey, not everything is just black and white. Not everything, you know, not everyone is out of church just because they're a wicked rebellion. Sometimes they got things going on in their life. You know, you, you learn about these things and you, you learn a bit of gentleness. You learn a bit of love to be able to relate to people but you're trying to strike that balance of firmness and grace, right? Not a novice. So why is it dangerous to be a novice if you don't have that experience? Because you can be wrong and then when you're lifted up to a position where you have authority, you have influence, sometimes that echo chamber can be deafening, right? Where you don't have that experience to know, hey, you don't know everything. And this is what the... What does it mean to fall? This is, this is interesting. Hopefully you guys pick are listening still. <laughs> it's interesting when it says you fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, when we get into the next passage, it's going to say the snare of the devil. What's the difference? I don't know if you've ever thought about this or ever noticed this. What, what happens sometimes when a novice is lifted up and he's wrong and he's corrected, sometimes his pride gets him out of church. Have you ever seen that before? When somebody's wrong, they just disappear. Or they do something wrong, right? And, and, you know, they're not, they don't have the experience and the humility to go, man, like, because I'm a sinner, that's, I, I realize I can, I'm capable of these things. Sometimes a novice just thinks, oh, man, I'm living for God, I'm untouchable, right? And then they do something like commit fornication or adultery, and then where do they go? They're gone, out of church. 
That's what I think this is referring to. They fall into the condemnation of the devil, meaning they, they actually quit. They're, not, they're, not, they're still saved, but they quit on the faith. They get out of the work. And you see that sometimes with people that lift it up too fast and then they fall, right? And then they just fall too hard and they get out. Now, why do I think that? I don't know if you've ever noticed this. This is a bit of an exhortation for you guys. But you know when people get out of church, the Bible, I believe, actually describes that as you being delivered unto Satan. I want to just show you some of these passages here. I just think it's interesting because you know what, what? You know the reason why I'm showing you this? Because I think a lot of us are just lackadaisical about coming to church and the importance of church. And I want to show you here, when you're, when you're out of church, you're in a very dangerous position, not only for yourself, but for your family. Now, I've been talking about example for yourself, for other people, and for your children. But look at what the Bible says here. Look in 1 Corinthians 5. This is about kicking somebody out of church for sin, right? For certain sins. It says, It was reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. I'll skip through for sake of time. But look how he says here. He says, That he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. And then Paul goes on to say, hey, I've already judged. If somebody's committed this and it's, and, it's, and it's reported commonly among you, take him out of the church. Get him away from you. And look at what he says here. When you gather together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, look, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And you kind of think, why would Paul liken excommunicating, removing somebody from the fellowship of the church as delivering them unto Satan. So you see how it's not a good thing to be out of church. You need to be in church when the Bible's describing hey, being out of church as being in Satan's realm. Now people, this person is being delivered unto Satan unwillingly. But how many of us willingly deliver ourselves unto Satan when we get out of church? We're not in church. And you know what it is? It's not just the destruction of the flesh, but it's the influence. Because you get out of church, you start having the wrong thoughts, the wrong perspectives, not coming to church, being reminded that, hey man, you guys are here to live for God, not for your job, not for money, not for just, you know, are you living to satisfy what other people think of you? Other people wonder about how you dress. Other people wonder about how much time you spend serving God. Other people wonder, oh, you know, why well, you wake up so early and go to church? You spend so You're there at church every Sunday. Do you worry about those things? Or do you think, you know what? It doesn't matter what people think. I'm not living for them. I'm living for God. I'm not going to deliver myself unto Satan. You know? Look, 1 Timothy 5. Talking about the, the younger widows not taking them on because he says, hey, they'll cast off their first faith. And look at what he says here. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Look, for some are already turned aside after Satan. You see how they get out of the work, they get out of church, and then they're turned aside after Satan. And this last one I'll show you in 1 Timothy 1. This is when he's charging Timothy, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. And here's some people that were in the wrong, right? Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So what has Paul done to them? He's kicked them out of church. So I want, I want you to notice, isn't that interesting? Like getting out of church is likened unto being delivered unto Satan. Don't do that to yourself voluntarily. You know, these people are not doing it voluntarily. They're getting kicked out of the assembly of God. But us today, man, we voluntarily take ourselves out. It's like in the olden days, right? Uh, in, in the Old Testament, you see all the babies getting killed. And nowadays, people willingly kill their babies. You know, it's like it's crazy. All right, let's try and get through this. So moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into reproach. And the snare of the devil, so the condemnation of the devil is getting out of church. What's the snare of the devil? What's a snare? A snare is something that stops you from moving, right? It's a trap. So sometimes you may be in church, but it stops your progress. So what is this talking about? Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. You know, I used to think, because when you look at are without in the Bible, it's generally those that are not associated with you. So there's two ways you can kind of understand this one is you have to have a good re a good report like your reputation 
with those that are outside of the church should be good. Why? Because, you know, one way I used to think about this is, well, because if you have bad practices outside of church and then you're lifted up to a place of authority and influence and then those, that bad report from without the church now affects God's work, it's going to put a snare on you, right? That's like the devil putting a snare on that work because now it's tarnished. You know, when people, you know, become leaders and then all their dirty laundry comes out, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a reproach to the name of Christ. But another way you can think about this, those that are without are those that are poor, right? Those without belonging. So it's saying here, you not only have to have a good reputation amongst those that are rich, right? Or those that have possessions, but you need to get along with people that are rich and poor. Why? Because it keeps you humble lest you fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. What is that talking about? Well, in 1 Timothy 6, it says here, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. See, so that's why you need to know people that are not only rich and poor, so you keep yourself humble, right? As opposed to just knowing people that are rich and then you start being influenced by the, fill, uh, the, the greediness of this world. Into many foolishness and hurtful lusts, which drown many destruction and petition, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. He does that reproach and snare of the devil. First Timothy 3 a. We'll go through these ones a bit quicker because now, really now we're looking at deacons. And deacons really are the same as bishops in, the, in terms of their qualifications. They have different role in the church in terms of authority bishops have authority to rule and make decisions whereas deacons they they usually hold positions of leadership but they have they're more of a servant rather than a, a decision maker so likewise must the deacons be grave and that's why they're when you go through their qualifications it's really repeating the same thing it's just saying hey just because somebody's a servant at church that doesn't mean they shouldn't have the same standard applied to them in order to have that office not double tongued what does that mean it means you say what you mean you know say one thing and do another thing so as Christians, we ought to have that too. Not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith. So now there is, hey, we have to know what we believe in a pure conscience, but still about how we live, right? Make sure that we're living right so our conscience is pure. And let these also first be proved. So you see that it's not only the bishop that has to be proved, it's the deacon as well. And who's he proving themselves to? They're proving themselves to those already in authority to see whether or not they can hold that office. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. What does that mean? Then they can take on that role of a bishop. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. So this is where I was saying that, see, even in this qualification list, don't skip over 1 Timothy 3, ladies, because in 1 Timothy 3, there is a qualification for the ladies as well saying, hey, this is how a godly lady should act because this is what is expected of the wife of the bishop and the deacon. But for the men, you need to realize, hey, you know how your wife behaves? How spiritual your wife is, is a reflection on your own spirituality. That's why the qualification is there because you can't have a guy who's supposedly spiritual, but his wife, you know, is not dressing properly is not talking properly, is not faithful at church, doesn't want to be involved in any of the ministries at church, that's a reflection of the man's example, the man's spirituality, right? Because your spirituality, if it's going to rub off on anyone, it's going to rub off on your wife. So if it's not rubbing off on your wife, then you've got to think, hey, I've got to think, how, what, is, what is my spirituality if my wife is not somebody that can be looked up to from other Christian girls? Even so must their wives be grave, so serious about things, not slanderers. What's a slanderer? It's when you're talking false things about other people. Girls especially, you don't want to be a slanderer. Why? Because girls have more of a tendency to gossip about people, to assume things, to make things up about people. You know, you think that somebody hasn't really said something, but you're assuming it and you're now telling something. You know, I, they didn't say this, but I know they're thinking that. That's slandering somebody right gossiping about them and you know what ladies you don't, you don't only you don't only slander about other people but you know you can slander your husband as well right so make sure guys you're not slandering your husband because 
women do that too, right? Because now you're married to this guy. Guys, do it too. You know, don't slander your wife. But ladies as well, because now you're married to this guy, start realizing he's not that prince that he's all, that he's all cracked up to be, right? And now you know the real guy, you know, in the house. And what, you get together with your buddies, you start slandering him. You ought not to, that's, not, that's not a godly lady, right? Slandering her husband. Why? Because a, because a wife is meant to be sober and faithful in all things. So don't you want to be faithful? A faithful wife? And part of being a faithful wife to your husband is that you make your husband look good. That's, that's, that's part of it, ladies. You know, you, look at Proverbs 12. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. You put a crown on, it makes you look good. It makes you lift. If you think about a crown, it's like authority, isn't it? It makes a man feel like a king. But she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Rottenness in your bones, like a, it's like a, a disease that kills you, right? So what sort of woman do you want to be, right? Slanderer or faithful in all things? That's why women should be thinking about how they behave, how they talk, the information that they share, because you, when, when somebody, when you're, when you're done talking about your husband, do people think more highly of him or do they think less of him? They ought to think more highly of him. They ought to think, you know, hey, this wife is happy being married to this woman. Even if you're not happy, that's what you've got to work on, right? With him. But then you don't go and slander it with other people so that other people's view of him is diminished. Your job is to make other people's view of him increase and be a crown to your husband. Let's keep going. First Timothy 3. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. So you see the same, same issue there. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I'm just skipping over these ones because... Um, I've, I've sort of talked about the things I want to talk about here in this passage. These things write unto thee shortly, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, and again, just a reminder, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Right? So your example, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy... And really, I think it ends on this because this is really the truth that we're trying to uphold, right? That Jesus Christ came into the world, God manifest in the flesh, manifest in the flesh, died for our sins, was raised again and will one day come again. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory so i hope that sermon was a good reminder for you guys to up the standard of your living think about your example make sure your marriages or your family is in order because there's more at stake than just you right this is the work of god that we are doing all right let's pray thank you lord for the reminder this morning lord i need it too lord i'm not i'm not perfect so I just pray, Lord, that we would all be edified and encouraged to live the best life we can. Why? Because, Lord, it's going to affect you, it's going to affect your people, it's going to affect our children, it's going to affect this church. So, Lord, help us not to deliver ourselves unto Satan. Help us to make sure we are in church, prioritizing church, and, Lord, we understand the importance of the community and the family we are trying to build here. So thank you, Lord. Because of your blood, this is even possible. We pray these things in your name. Amen.